Welcome everybody to this interview from the Civil War Institute. I'm Brendan Neely, and today I'm talking to Dr. Matthew Hernando. He is the author of Faces Like Devils, The Bald Knobber Vigilantes in the Ozarks. Um, the book is fantastic. Dr. Hernando um, is a full-time instructor at Coconino Community College in Flagstaff, Arizona, and received his doctorate from Louisiana State University. Today we'll be talking about the role that the Civil War played in the construction of vigilante groups like the Bald Knobbers, and about the research he did for his work, um, Faces Like Devils. Um, Dr. Hernando, thank you for joining me today. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. So let's start off with a short discussion about the Bald Knobbers. Um, I grew up in the Ozarks region where they um, roamed around and worked. Um, and so I grew up with some of the folklore and mythos of the Bald Knobbers ingrained. And it wasn't until um, I started doing some more formal research that I began to, to genuinely learn about um, what of that was folklore and what of that was, was true history and to make that distinction. Uh, many people aren't as familiar with the bald knobbers as, as those of us in the Ozarks are. And so I'd be curious, what would your three minute introduction to the bald knobbers be? Who were they? Why did they organize? Um, and what did they do? So yeah, great question. Um, so one of the common questions that I get from people ever since I began working on this project as a dissertation back at LSU, um, and ever, of course, ever since I've published the book five years ago is who are the bald knobbers and how do they get that funny name? Um, and there's very often some type of off color joke about the name, uh, which typically involves the word polishing, but we won't, don't need to go there. Um, so the bald knobbers were a vigilante organization founded in the town of Forsyth um, in Taney County. Missouri, which is right there. For those of the listeners who may not be familiar where Taney County is, it's right down on the border, Missouri border with Arkansas. So it's right down in the, the extreme southern end of the state. Um, and tradition has it that the founding members of the group, there are supposedly a, a group of 13 of them, uh, 13 prominent citizens, including Nat Kinney, um, Alonzo Prather, James K. Polk McAfee, Charles Groom, uh, and many others. They met at uh, the back of, uh, of James Everett's general store uh, in Forsyth. Uh, the group originally called itself the Committee for Law and Order, um, but they got their name from the site of their first large scale meeting. They met on top of a high treeless hill summit called Snap's Bald, which was named after Harrison Snap, who was one of the first settlers uh, in the area. And when the locals, when particularly the locals who didn't necessarily approve of them and what they were aiming to do and, and, and their methods, when they saw where they were meeting, they kind of sarcastically referred to, oh, I should, I should go back and mention, at this time in Southwest Missouri and, and in Arkansas for that matter, there were a lot of high treeless hill summits. So you have trees around the base and sort of middle of the hill, but at the top of the hill, you wouldn't have trees very often the, the because there'd be rocky outcroppings at the top of the hill which would prevent trees from growing and locals called those balds or bald knobs right so snaps bald was this high treeless or uh, high bald hill summit uh, in in the local vicinity um, and when locals saw where the bald knobbers were meeting, they kind of sarcastically referred to them as bald knobbers, intending it as an insult, but as often happens with pejoratives, the name stuck and the members of the group took it for themselves. Yeah. Um, for those of you who might have uh, ever gone to, my first introduction to the bald knobbers was actually fire in the hole. <laughs> uh, the um, the, the ride at Silver Dollar City. Uh, that's complete mythology. The bald numbers never burn down a town. Uh, don't get, get caught up in that. That's, you know, that's just window dressing for tourists. Um, but so that's who they, who they are. They, 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 they spread from Taney County to neighboring Christian and Douglas counties. Um, and they operate in different places in those three counties for about four years, from about 18, 85 to 1889, after which the movement pretty much peters out. Um, they, end, they end in violence. Well, it peters out after a couple of major violent incidents. 
um, in in uh, Christian County, that was the Eden's Green killings in uh, March of 1887. Um, in Taney County, uh, that would have been, of course, the assassination of Nat Kinney, and then, of course, uh, the death of uh, of um, Galba Branson and Ed Funk uh, in the Fourth of July shootout uh, in Taney County in 1889. So, yeah. Um, next question. Yeah, fantastic. Um, ironically, my introduction to the bald knobbers was also fire in the hole. Um, for viewers who aren't from the area, Many people there is, <laughs> there is a, a theme park in Branson, Missouri called Silver Dollar City, um, which is a 19th century themed amusement park and tourist center. And there's a ride called Fire in the Hole, um, which is a kind of narrative roller coaster experience, someone would say. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and the narrative that it takes you on is the bald knobbers um, burning the town, the townspeople reacting in various comedic ways. Um, and kind of the consequences of that um, with plenty of humor and thrill. Um, for many of the people uh, nearby, that was our introduction to the bald knobbers. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to hear that that was also yours. Yep. The, what you touch on there is super interesting. The, the bald knobbers, um, for many of us, we hear in the commercial sense. Branson also has a musical comedy group called the bald knobbers, which mm -hmm. has achieved some popularity. Um, and many people know them as just that, perhaps um, their involvement in the film Shepherd of the Hills um, mm -hmm. and kind of mythology around that. But there's somewhat and of the a play. Lack. Yep, <laughs> the play, the, play. Um, the associated kind of park area is now there. Yeah. Um, but there is kind of a lack of uh, large scale, um, serious approach to historically understanding those characters. Do you think that that kind of commercialization plays into it? Um, and then what was it that made you move beyond just the folklore and to take an actual historical look at it? Uh, so great question. Um, short answer to that question is, is um, so sorry, your question about commercialism, uh, what, has the commercialism played a role in, in, in what, in discouraging serious historical inquiry? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think the fact that the bald knobbers have been used, the bald knobbers or the memory of the bald knobbers has been used for so many years as essentially a tourism draw, um, makes the topic seem to be very parochial. Um, in other words, very locally focused in a narrow sort of way. And um, parochialism discourages a lot of serious historical inquiry. Unless you're somebody like me who really loves local history, in which case it kind of drew me. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you how this, how this all got started for me. This, uh, this research project that eventually became my dissertation, that eventually became my book. It started out with a research seminar that I took, I wanna say it was either my first or my second year at LSU. I think it was the early second year at LSU. It was a 19th century US history research uh, seminar. And I did, um, I did a research paper on um, the history of Christian County, uh, Missouri. And um, and it was it was more of a it was more of a broad history of the region. I can't even tell you what my central thesis was at this point, but I had like two or three pages of it that dealt with the bald numbers. Um, and my professor at that time, Dr. Colbert, said, uh, "This is an interesting group." He wrote. I even wrote in the margins, "This is an interesting group. I'd like to know more about them." I said to myself. I would too. <laughs> and so I decided to pursue it as a, uh, eventually I decided to pursue it as a serious uh, research topic as the focal point of my, um, my dissertation that eventually became my book. So, uh, and of course, of course, it's because I came from Missouri that I was interested uh, in Missouri history, even though I went to school down in, in uh, Louisiana, I always uh retained a fascination for the history of the Ozarks. The Ozarks are one of those neglected or uh, badly neglected or understudied regions uh, in the US. Appalachia, and there, there's, 
a bunch of historians in the Ozarks who kind of talk about this amongst uh, amongst ourselves. Why why is there so so little professional interest in this region specifically? Appalachia gets a massive amount. You know, their entire historical societies dedicated uh, to the study of Appalachia, but the Ozarks not so much. Um, and I can't really tell you what the reason for that is, um, other than maybe there's a lot more conflict in Appalachia or in other sort of sub-regions of the United States, whereas the Ozarks has less, less class conflict, um, not as much racial conflict, although there is some uh, in the area. If you've ever read um, uh, Harper's White Man's Heaven, um, there is some um, conflict breeds interest. Um, but of course, the bald numbers are an episode of, uh, of local conflict um, as, as well. And that kind of drew my, my attention to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. The, the idea that the local history of the Ozarks has been overshadowed, um, I, you know, to me is an accurate one. And it's one that um, is really interesting. As we begin to talk about the ways that the bald knobbers come out of the Civil War and how the Civil War sets the stage for vigilante groups like the bald knobbers, um, if you had to describe the ways that um, the unique history of the Ozarks region during the Civil War um, kind of sets that stage, what would you point out and what factors would you include in, in kind of a crash course on Ozark Civil War history for the bald knobbers? Okay. Well, um, as I'm sure you're aware, having read my book and probably some other uh, works about the history of the Ozarks during, uh, during the Civil War, the history of Missouri during the Civil War, um, there's not a lot of large battles fought in the Ozarks or indeed in, in Missouri in general uh, during the Civil War. Um, Battle of Wilson's Creek would be one exception uh, to that. And, and even that was a relatively small scale battle compared to what you see happening out in the East. Um, but what, what you do see happening uh, here in the Ozarks, I say here, there in the Ozarks, um, is a massive epidemic of internecine uh, guerrilla war. Um, so basic, or what, what is sometimes called partisan conflict involving small bands of men, very often recruited locally from one side uh, versus the other, conducting hit and run raids on each other, uh, assassination, uh, intimidation, destruction of property, sometimes just straight out murder um, of one another and one's family members. And, you know, we characterize the Civil War as a war of brother against brother. Um, that's not always the case in all theaters uh, of the Civil War, but in, um, but in Missouri, and in the Ozarks, it, it definitely is the case. It is brother against brother, or very often, more often neighbor against neighbor, as most families went, went one way or the other for the, for the Union or the Confederacy. But, but people knew, um, people knew the people that they were fighting against. So what does that do? Well, after the war is over, um, there's this, all of a sudden there's this four year long bloody history of internecine conflict between people who now have to live with, with each other. Um, and that's gonna lead to a legacy of bitterness and mistrust between former Confederates and former un unionists that polarized social relationships as well as local politics. I talk about that in my book, how the war po polarizes. Um, the, the war gets reflected in the Republican versus the Democrat. Uh, political divide in local politics in, in Taney County, uh, especially um, with, you know, most of the former unionists siding with the Republicans, most of the former Democrats siding, former Confederate siding with the Democrats and so on. So it polarizes social relationships and local politics. Uh, wartime allegiances also influence who joins vigilance committees um, and who opposes them. In the case of the bald knobbers, and you having read my book, you know this, um, the vast majority of bald knobbers who are of military age are former unionists. In Taney County, where there's actually an organized opposition, referred to sometimes loosely as the anti-bald knobbers, the vast majority of those people who were of military age during the Civil War were former Confederates, right? And, or very often their sons. 
on either side. And so that's interesting. Um, you know, that was one that when I began re researching the demographic backgrounds of the known members of the bald knobbers and the anti bald knobber groups, that was one of the first things that jumped out at me. Um, how, how polarized they were in terms of their wartime backgrounds. I'm sorry. No worries. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. The, uh, the Zoom experience has uh, many more surprises than I think any of us expected. So it's exactly. no big deal at all. Yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I should have put it on mute. It's, it's done now. <laughs> You're good. Um, so, um, so wartime, as I said, wartime allegiances affect who joins vigilante groups uh, and who opposes them. Um, it also leaves behind a large body of young men. I say young men, the young men after the war, and of course they become middle-aged men 20 years later, but it leaves behind a large body of young men um, with weapons training, many of them with scores to settle, grudges against people that they live next to, um, who had learned that violence was a good way of solving problems because that was how they uh, solved things during the war. And so of course um, that's going to that's going to bleed over in, in a variety of ways. Um, it bleeds over into you know escalating crime rates in Missouri in the post-Civil War years, you know, escalating outlawism. Um, and it's going to bleed over into the, the large number of vigilante groups, not just the bald knobbers, of course, as you know, you've read my book. There's a bunch of different vigilante groups that form across the state of Missouri. Marbenton League in Vernon County, um, Clark County, the um, Anti-Horse Thief Association, Green County Regulators, and so on and so forth. Um, so, and that's hardly surprising. So, right. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, the way that um, some of your research methodology included not just the social constraints of distrust and, um, you know, for lack of a professional term, just grudges, um, those kind of residual feelings. Um, the political situation I thought was fascinating between Republicans and Democrats um, in Taney County in particular, and about some of the actions that uh, the Missouri state governor or the Missouri state government um, took following the war in terms of disenfranchisement um, and voting rights certainly yeah. is an aspect of civil war legacy and of reconstruction that's um, oftentimes uh, missed over or, or kind of forgotten yeah. about and left behind. Um, for you, when, when you're writing about vigilante justice at large and the bald knobbers in particular, where does that fall in the larger scope of civil war history for you? Um, and, and what areas are uncovered that we haven't fully looked at yet? Um, so there's a there's sort of a burgeoning field of uh, si of civil war subspecialists who focus on guerrilla his you know guerrilla warfare uh, in general, um, and it ties as I've indicated before it ties into that pretty well um, because a lot of the areas that are particularly a lot of the areas of the country that are particularly riven by guerrilla warfare also see a big upsurge in vigilante justice. Um, after the war is over. Um, Missouri, uh, also, you know, West Virginia, Tennessee, etc. Um, so it, so it, it sort of ties into that um, subspecialty. Um, so in terms of what, I think what areas of, of um, vigilante justice would be, would be profitable or fruitful areas for further research, I would like to see other historians explore the connection, um, as I have done, between Civil War loyalties and vigilante organizing and vigilante membership. Um, because I think what, what you'll end up finding, I did it with the bald numbers, but, but other historians could do it with other groups as well, other vigilante groups as well. I think what you'll end up finding is that a whole lot of the, the, the founding members of other late 19th century vigilante groups are Civil War veterans. Mm -hmm. That is my hypothesis, although I've only done the research for one group to prove that. Certainly. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be fascinating. And I think that connection um, that you make in the book is, is pretty clear. 
Um, in fact, it brings about one of my personal favorite anecdotes from your work. Um, you're describing the murder of one Samuel Snap. Um, and uh, I'll just read from the conclusion of the book. You write, thus, when Wash Middleton called Samuel Snap a bushwhacker just before gunning him down on a public street in Kirbyville, yep. he demonstrated that he had transferred the old hostility for his wartime enemies to his new adversaries in the anti bald number faction. Right. That, that anecdote illustrates so much about your research to me. Um, yeah. and, and I love using Because, that of course, Snap was loyalty. not a bushwhacker, <laughs> right? He wasn't old enough. He, could, he wasn't around uh, during the Civil War to play, to play that role. But yeah, okay. it's, finish what you were saying. Yeah, it's, it, it, it connects. It makes so many of those connections and forces us to address all those within one specific instance. Um, yeah. Is there something, a historical event or a person that you came across in your research and writing um, that sticks out to you as particularly interesting or meaningful, um, or just somebody you'd love to talk about another time? Uh, a, a person or or an event? You're saying? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you know, one person who fascinates me is is Wash Middleton. Um, he was Nat Kenny's right hand man. Uh, some accounts describe him as his bodyguard. And by all accounts, he was a, a terrifying individual. Um, and, and he leads a, and he leads a, um, a brutal, tragic, bloody life. I, I wish I had more information about him. You know, obviously he guns down, guns down snap. You know, he escapes from jail. He goes on the run. He is himself eventually uh, killed uh, down in Arkansas, um, I I I would be I would be very interested. I mean, I'll, there's not going to be enough information to to prove this one way or another. But I'd be very interested to know if he was suffering from PTSD, mm. um, and if that impacted his behavior, uh, because I wouldn't be surprised. Um, an event that I found especially uh, compelling. Well, one of the events that transfixed me early on in my research into this topic was the Eden Screen killing. Um, what an absolute unnecessary tragedy. Two men, Charles Green, William Edens, died for no other reason than that one of them had been heard talking bad about the bald knobbers, you know, comparing them to a sheep killing dog or something to that effect. Um, two women rendered widows for 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 no good reason whatsoever other than some of the bald knobbers resented what he had been um, saying about them in public and one of the ironies of that is the meeting and you probably remember this uh, from the book the meeting that they'd held right before that uh, that killing took place some of the members of the group had been trying to disband the group because they realized that things were getting out of hand and then they did get out of hand uh, in a pretty horrific way. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it, it ruins the lives of all of everybody involved. You know, three, three more men, three bald knobbers are executed. Fourth one, Wiley Matthew should have been executed, but he managed to manage to escape. Um, just think about all of the lives that were ruined. Uh, there, not just the people who died, but their families and so on. Um, it really illustrates the inherent dangers, the, both the lore and the dangers of vigilante justice. The idea that you have the right to take it upon yourself to decide what the law is and how it's going to be enforced in your community without, without any legitimate uh, conference of authority to you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that, that, uh, that event has always stuck with me. Mm. I think particularly as it's described in such evocative detail in the Supreme Court records. Yeah, you know, there's one, I think you probably remember there's one passage from the book that talks about the, the two kids that are there, you know, wading through the, through the blood on their hands and knees and leaving bloody handprints on the walls and so on. 
Go ahead. Certainly. Um, I, I think that brings me to, to my final question of the evening. Um, it, it's a difficult story, um, not just to hear. Um, you talk about the graphic detail there um, and that the bald numbers are a group of violent vigilantes who emerge out of um, a violent form of guerrilla fighting throughout the Civil War. Um, and so to engage just on a human level and to understand the, the pain and suffering that's received and inflicted is difficult. So much of the bald knobbers behavior, the history around them and the history of the Civil War, particularly in this moment nationally, um, we're trying to determine what some of that means. How do we interpret it? Um, how do we analyze it? Um, who do we listen to? Who do we not listen to? All these things are discussed in the national discourse about Civil War history um, and are brought up um, through your research. The research itself is, is fascinating because it doesn't just deal with clear historic evidence, but also a ton with folk narratives, legend, mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence in moments where we're talking a lot about what those things mean. Um, what types of material helped you sort between what's real and what's rumor? Yeah, Sift so between the fake news and the real news? Yeah, something, you know, one might say. Sure. Um, so, so you're right. Um, episodes of history, both, both the remote past, uh, not, and the not so remote past episodes like this breed a lot of folklore and, and myth and, um, and fake news and, and so on. Um, you have to stick, you have to stick closest to the sources. You have to stick closest to the primary sources. Um, for me, court case records, uh, Missouri Supreme Court, local circuit court uh, records uh, were probably the most helpful um, because you know there you have people testifying under oath to what they witnessed. Um, and you have the possibility of cross-examination uh, of the evidence. Um, not that not that the courts always get everything right, but um, you know facts that are being testified to under oath in a courtroom where there's a potential penalty for for lying or withholding evidence, um, you're more likely going to going to get closer to the truth there than than almost any other uh, type of primary source material that you can. Um, that you can find. Uh, newspapers are also helpful. Um, although for, for me, particularly the, um, the newspapers that I surveyed, I, I found that the newspapers closest to the action uh, tended to be the most reliable. The further, you, the further away you got from Southwest Missouri, the more likely you were to have um, you know, folklore and mythology and fake news and so on creeping into the creeping into the covers, sensationalism. Um, because the national, and, and I talk about this in, in the book, particularly in the wake of the Eden's Green's killing, the Eden's Green killing in uh, 1887, um, there is a, a brief upsurge in national interest in the bald knobbers, a brief upsurge in national interest in this, in this episode of you know, local Missouri Ozarks history. Um, and it gets covered coast to coast. Newspapers from New York to Boston to Dallas, all, all across the country. Um, and what they tend to latch on to are some of the, are typically the more lurid and sensational aspects of the case, the parts that are most easily exaggerated. So stick closest stick to the closest to the sources that are closest to the actual event um, and to the participants involved. That's my, uh, that's always my recommendation. Your word of advice. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Not, for that, local so not that local sources can never get stuff wrong. I don't mean to imply that. Right. You, always, you always have to weigh all, sift through all of the evidence and compare it and contrast it and look at the motives of the people giving, you know, giving the evidence and so on. But go ahead, you were gonna say? Um, I was just gonna wrap up. I wanna be respectful of your time, um, but that answer was great. Um, thank you for speaking to me today. I know I've enjoyed your work, um, particularly as like you described, I begin to move away from a limited view of the Civil War 
um, and to consider how those perspectives and ideas and loyalties um, were different across the nation. Um, I think I find that when I take a step back from some of the kind of name brand battles um, and look for other perspectives, when I return to the battles everyone knows, um, I find myself arriving with a better sense of the war as a whole um, and a richer understanding of the people who fought um, out there. Um, having that larger understanding has been valuable for me. Um, and so your, your work has been a part of that. And I just wanted to thank you. Um, as I introduced, um, Dr. Hernando's book is Faces Like Devils, The Bald Knobber Vigilantes um, in the Ozarks. If you're interested um, in getting that, I'm sure we will link it in the description. Um, and I just want to thank you one last time. You're very welcome, Brandon. It's been wonderful talking to you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this topic that I don't get to talk about every day anymore. So <laughs> you have a good one. You too. All right. Bye-bye.